Oh, man. Preaching to myself right there. Man. Excited. Woo. Y'all ready for a sermon? All right. Let's have some church in here today. We're going to be continuing our series. We're actually going to be doing a prequel um, of how David got to the throne. And there's some interactions that I wanted to pick up, felt inspired to share with you. And I think that it gives us uh, some level of prognosis for how we sometimes have bad perceptions. And um, I want to kind of play that out this morning with a couple of generals that belong to different kings. And we'll get into it. And there's going to be some names, so we're going to have to do some heavy lifting today, okay? So there's going to be a fair amount of Bible history that is wrapped in today's message. And I wish that I could do it in a, in a more simplistic manner, but I don't think that I can. And so therefore, you're just going to have to follow along today, okay? This is, this is going to be a, a, a synthetic sermon in which you have to build one concept upon another upon another, okay? So before we get into any of that, we are going to have fun so we can get our brains working. I want you to Look at the person next to you, and I want you to put your palm against the palm of another person, okay? Your palm against the palm of another person. And then I want you to take your two fingers, and I want you to rub it up and down those, those palms that are together, all right? You rub it up and down. And you, you should experience what we call a dead finger, um, okay? All right? Okay. Game time is over. Game time is over. Bring it back in. Hey, hey. It's not patty cake, all right? All right. So listen, listen. Our brains are wired in a way that whenever multiple receptions are coming in, our brain has to choose. It can't simultaneously fill both of those things at the same time. So it gives you a false perception. Your finger isn't actually dead, is it? You, you don't believe that. If you do, then you're a person that believes in magic too, right? I mean, they can't really make things appear that aren't, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's a perception, but it is in opposition to reality. And so if, if all the time, whenever we're going through life and whenever we're experiencing these things, if we are going off of our perception without fact-checking it, against reality, sometimes our feelings are going to lead us into places that are going to be destructive. And I hope today that we can see through some interactions that David's general had with Saul's general that there were some times where if, if the, the pursuit of God would have been there, they wouldn't have arrived at the wrong conclusion. And I, I want your, your takeaway today to be what picture are you aiming at? What picture are you aiming at? Are you, are you aiming at the picture of, of God being on the throne of your life, or do you have another picture? Because all of our past experiences tend to influence and color the picture of how we look at life. And if you look at life uh, through the lens of your own flesh or your own ego or through the eyes of some other person, um, those have so many pitfalls and I think that the right picture should be look, look at your life through the lens of what God says about it, about what God says about marriage, about what God says about parenting, about God says, well, your finances or your passions, your profession. What does God want you to do? And, I, and instead, if we substitute what God wants for what I want or what I feel or what someone else wants or what they feel, all of a sudden you have this mired picture, and now all of a sudden you, you don't have precision in your motivation and your movement, okay? So we're going to put a, a diagram up on the screen, two columns, and these are going to be our characters in today's story. If you're taking notes, which I encourage you to do, um, 2 Samuel chapter 2 and 2 Samuel chapter 3 is where all of this information is going to be housed. In order for me to cover it all, I'm going to have to summarize and storytell versus read 50, 70 verses, okay? So Saul was the first king of Israel. His right-hand man, his general, was named Abner, okay? So Saul is Abner. Abner is Saul, okay? That's one team, okay? Tonight we'll be having a men's scavenger hunt. It's going to be blue against red, okay? In this story, red is Saul, which is the loser and bad, okay? Has so everybody got that? Is everybody on the page? Okay. So Saul, at the, this particular juncture of this story, has passed away. He died in a battle. And 
now Abner is actually ruling by proxy, even though Saul has a son named Ishbosheth, not important for this morning. He's ruling as a proxy general um, of the northern kingdom. David, at this point, has been enthroned in Judah, the southern kingdom, and he has three generals, okay? he got Abishai, he's got Azahel, and he's got Joab. And Joab is going to be our principal player today, but Azahel, his brother, is going to have a bad experience. And then it's going to be how Joab handles that bad experience, that bitterness, maybe slash revenge, that gets us into some trouble. And so as you are thinking about this morning's message, message and how you can apply it to your life, you have to ask yourself, what bad experiences have you had that you are allowing to impact your current perception of life, of love, of all of the good things that are supposed to be good? And if you're not careful, you will taint the things that are supposed to be good because you're not looking at them through the lens of God. And so I want to tell you the background story is with Azahel and Abner. And so there was this battle that was being fought. So for the better part of several years after Saul dies, there's a war going on between David and Saul's house. Even though Saul has perished, this house is still fighting for power. And so David is trying to consolidate power and the northern kingdom is trying to hold on to power. And so the, the generals meet, all three brothers, and against Abner, they meet and they decide to let some of their young men fight it out so that their whole armies aren't going to have to face each other, right? And so we're just like, hey, maybe we'll just let a few fight for the outcome versus having to sacrifice our entire army. And so they fought and Abner's team lost the battle, okay? It was a, Few men, 20, 30 men that, that were involved in the battle versus the thousands that they had. Well, Azahel was really fast. I mean, really fast. I'm talking Ezekiel Elliott, the first season that he played in the NFL, fast. Not the next three seasons, okay? Not fast now at all. That was my Dallas Cowboy joke. It flopped, just like, never mind. Anyway, and so... So Azahel was really fast, and even though they had already won the battle, he decided to chase after Abner. And it says that he could run like a wild gazelle. And so Abner is retreating, and he says, Azahel, is that you? Is that you that's behind me? And Azahel, full of a young man's pride and vinegar, um, was like, yes, it is me. And he's like, hey, you need to turn, you need to turn aside, turn to the left, turn to the right, because I don't want to have to do something to you, then I would not be able to face your brother Joab. So Joab, they once fought together on the same side, and now they were in opposition because of the divide in Saul and David's house. And so it says that Azahel kept on chasing him, kept pursuing him. And he says a second time, Azahel, turn aside, relent, give up, because I don't want to have to do something to you. Now, a lot of times whenever someone says that to us, we kind of think, oh, it's because they're afraid, right? Oh, they must be afraid. They must be afraid. I must be bigger. I must be stronger. I must be badder than they are. But no, sometimes it's because they're bigger and they're badder and they're stronger, but they're trying to give you mercy. Has anybody ever seen this played out? Like, oh, you got what you wanted? Mm, did you want it? Anyway, and so it says that finally Abner turns around, takes his spear, and boom, one shot. And there is Azahel dead. He had outrun all of his compatriots. None of his team was around him. He was running so fast. And I started thinking about that introduction to the sermon this morning, and I wanted to ask you a question. What are you chasing? What are you chasing this morning? What are you chasing? A lot of times we, we start chasing things that are leading us into bad situations. As a matter of fact, when we think about how fast he was, right? Speed without wisdom only gets you to the wrong outcome faster. 
Have you ever, you ever noticed that? That sometimes there are some people that like, their goal is just to do everything fast. Does that mean, does that mean that fast equals better? Huh? Huh? What? What? And every car accident I've ever been in, which now has been many years, thankfully, um, I, I will say that it was because I was in a hurry. I got into a hurry and I started being risky. I started, I started like pushing the envelope. I started not paying attention when I should have paid attention. And all of a sudden, wham, I was in an act. All because I wanted to go fast. Oh man, I had, I had to do it fast. I had to, had to get there. Even like traffic. Some of you compete in traffic. Tell me, tell me if I'm lying. Like if it stacks up on the tollway, do you mark a car? Does anybody else do this where you mark a car and like you got to beat that car? And like if that car gets ahead of you, you got to try to maneuver it back and forth. You know, you're going Ricky Bobby out there and you're trying to get ahead. And like, and like for what? You get no prize for getting home. Five minutes early, you, do, you get no prize. No prize. No prize. If you get in an accident, guess what you get? You get a bill. That's what you get, right? I want you to, be, how oftentimes do we mistake speed for accuracy? There's a saying in football that says, don't outkick your coverage. What that simply means is, for those of you that are non-football people, like when a punter kicks the ball, let's say that he can kick it 70 yards. If he kicks it far but not high, his team can't get down there to cover the kick. Ergo, the blocking gets set up. Ergo, the return is greater. Therefore, it doesn't help you to be able to kick it further because it doesn't work within the context of the team. Here is, here is Azahel, and he is chasing after his own destruction. And the enemy of him is telling him, stop doing it. Let it go. Elsa, Elsa that, right? Let it go. Let it go. Don't hold it back anymore. Some of you this morning, you can't let it go, can you? You can't let it go. You are holding on for dear life. You are chasing something that is going to burn you. All for the name of what? The battle had already been won. It turns into selfish glory. There's a saying in the business world that says, don't negotiate past yes. If you've already gotten the yes... Why are you still talking? Have you ever gotten in the car with your spouse and you said you shared too much? Has anybody ever, has anybody ever, by show of hands, you ever had that conversation? Hey, you shared too much. Yeah. Like, or, or you were getting ready to hire someone and, and like all of a sudden you decide to share one more story and then they started looking at you like, I don't know if I want to work here. You know, it's like, it's like you, had, you had the yes and then you went too far. And here is Azahel, he's, he's one but now he's got, to, he's got to push it. He's got to push it. And so oftentimes when we begin to push things for our own selfish purposes, we get into trouble and it costs him his life. Well, now he has two brothers, Joab and Abishai. And they're upset about this. And a couple of years go by and now David is getting ready to consolidate power and Abner is actually always in the stories that we've read, trying to do the right thing. Abner, from all indications, was a good man, was a godly man. And outside of a couple of mistakes, Joab and Abishai are also great godly men. But just because we're great godly men doesn't mean we're not susceptible to making mistakes. And so it says that, that one, one time that Abner finally wants to bring the kingdom together. So David had been chosen by God to become the successor of Saul. And now that story is playing itself out in real time. Abner takes his entourage and he confers with the 11 tribes of the north. And he says to David, he comes down and he meets with him. And he says, I want to bring us together. I, I want us to stop the infighting. We don't need to have war between our own people. Let's, let's stop. I'm going to bring it all under your throne because Samuel said, this is God's will. This is God's word. So let's make this thing happen. David was in complete agreement. They threw a party. They had a feast. I mean, it was as good as it could possibly get 
We are going to now solve a problem between our tribes. We're going to perform God's will. And we can rejoice and celebrate because exactly what Samuel told me in the pasture is going to come to pass in the palace. What could go wrong from here? It says that Joab was out on a raid, so he wasn't there when Abner was there. And literally two ships passing in the night. As Abner was going back home to talk to his people, Joab was coming back to the palace. When Joab gets back to the palace, he hears that Abner was there. Now, if you're just guessing before we read it, just if you're just, do you think that Joab wanted David to party with the guy who killed his brother? Just, just out of curiosity, like, what do you think he wanted to happen? He wanted David to get justice on his behalf. And so this is what he said to David. We're going to read it in 2 Samuel chapter 3. Joab went into King David and said, what have you done? What have you done? You can hear the anger in his voice. Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away? Why did you let him go? So that he is gone. You know that Abner, listen to what his perception is. You know that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you and know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you are doing. To put it in the way that Major Payne would say it, you are plotting on me, boy, is what is what it is the perception of Joab. Joab can't believe that Abner could be honest. Why? Because of his past perceptions, his past experiences, his past pain. I want you to begin thinking about that, that that your thought process is ruled by all of these circumstances and interactions, and we could categorize it all into three categories. Number one, fact. Okay? Fact. A fact is something that is verifiably true. Okay? It's not subjective. It is objective. It is a fact. Okay? Whenever you begin to think about someone else and how you're going to interact with that person, is your thought process based upon fact? Because the second category is fantasy. Fantasy is what we want to be true. Have you ever tricked yourself into believing something about someone and then later on found out it wasn't true? Anybody? Anybody? We fantasize about the way we want it to go, but that's not how it is actually going. Does anybody live in this fantasy world sometimes? Like, it's like you want it to be true, but that doesn't make it. Does, he, does anybody ever look at your spouse like that? Just because you want it to be true, that does not make it, that does not make it true, Right? Fantasy is wanting something to be true. And then we have the last category, false. False is when I know it's not true, but I say it anyway. We might even call that a a lie. Words oftentimes are the mask that motives wear. You see, the words are what you say. The motive is why you say it. I want you to begin thinking about that. So many wives have said this many times. It's not what you said. It's the way you said it. Because they're hearing a motive, right? You're hearing a motive behind those. You're inferring a motive behind what was said. And it might be that it's hurtful. It might be that it is leading you to a place where you think that they're down. Whatever it is. We need to understand that we need to watch what people do, not what they say. Because actions speak louder than words. Okay, we're on the same team. We're on the same. Let's go. Let's go with this. Here is Joab arguing with David. He's saying, you know what Abner was trying to do? Abner was trying to get you. Abner is up to no good. Abner was spying on you to find out where your weaknesses are. That's what he was saying. But on the inside, what was he thinking about? I want my revenge. See, he was was couching it in a language that was about David. Hey, David, he's trying to get you. But in his heart, his motive was, I'm trying to get him. So you have to watch people. You have to watch people. 
What was God's will? God's will was to bring the kingdoms together and for David to be king. You gotta watch when someone else's words doesn't line up with God's will in your life, you should be suspicious. You should start being suspicious. You should start saying like, are they for me or are they against me? Because if God has revealed that this is his will for my life and this person is trying to distract me with their arguments, they have an agenda. They have something personal going on. And if you are naive, you will let them walk you right down the wrong path. It says that Joab went out after this meeting and he sent messengers to Abner. He's like, hey, uh, David had some more things he'd like to discuss. I just want to meet with you real quick over here at this gate. Just have a you know, private meeting, some of my guys, some of your guys. And they get over there to the meeting and he like put his arm around him. He's like, hey, come over here. Let's have a quick conversation. And as he walked him over to the side of the gate, he took out a knife. Stabbed him right in the gut. Died. Dark story, I know, right? There he is, dead. Revenge, he got it. And I started trying to put this together. Here was Abner. He came down to bless David. Here is Joab, David's right-hand man, who was trying to do all that he can, risking his life for David's good. But now Joab has a divided mind. And I want you to start thinking about that perception becomes deception when it's ruled by past pain. You see, Joab couldn't get over his past pain. And now he's looking at Abner through the lens of his past pain. He's holding Abner accountable for his brother's bad decision making. Because oftentimes when we have a loved one that is making bad decisions, we have to find someone to blame. It can't be their fault. It can't be their mistake. It can't be that they have an addiction and they have to be responsible for their act. We have to find someone in our culture today, someone to blame. Whenever we blame anyone but our own selves for our actions, all of a sudden, now I can start trying to look at, all of a sudden I start generalizing and generalizing, I start looking at all people through this lens and generalizing leads to justifying bad actions. Think about it. When you do something wrong, Raise your hands if you've ever done something wrong in here. Raise your hands. Okay, I just want to see if anybody was a narcissistic, delusional liar. Okay, so most of you passed. Um, so we, when we do something wrong, do you think that the average person in here, when you do something wrong, I know this is kind of heady today, but just bear with me. When you do something wrong, do you go, you know what, I am an evil person, and today... I am going to do evil. Is that what you... No, that's not what you do. You generalize and then you justify. You say to yourself, well, I don't think this is going to hurt anyone. Or I don't think that anybody would mind if I did... Somehow you arrive at a conclusion that makes what you're getting ready to do, getting ready to say okay. You have to suspend reality in your mind because God has obviously set the boundary of what is, what is right and what is true. And you, in your mind, move the boundary to accept your actions. And so, so as we, we do that, we oftentimes have these painful experiences that happen at some juncture. And this is how it would play out in real life. Let's say that some dog of a man cheated on you, all right? I'm talking a dog. I'm talking a dirty, oh gosh, I almost said something I shouldn't say. And so let's just say that they're a terrible person and now you might look at all men through this lens of you're just, you just know that they are going to cheat because all men must be cheaters, right? Has anybody ever seen someone who has this problem of hating men, right? Anybody? Like, yeah, yeah. I hear it all the time. It's like acceptable in today's culture to hate men. Like, all men are like, hey, if it's wrong for men to not do, like, to discriminate, it should be wrong to discriminate against men too. Can I get an amen from the brothers in the house? Like, right? Right? 
right, right. We're not all bad. We're not all bad. Not all of us are bad. Can you imagine how that would affect your relationship if you looked at the person that you married one day through the lens of what you were raised in? And, and maybe you were raised in a household where, where they did terrible things, where, where people hurt people, where people left people, where people did cheat, and now you're like paranoid, and so your perception is to look at people through this same lens. Let's just say that, let's just say that, uh, Maybe it was a friend, and a friend betrayed you. You ever been betrayed? Someone ever lied to you and told you they were going to do something, then they didn't do it? Yeah. I've been betrayed. Imagine what it starts to look like if I look at everybody with an eye of suspicion. Like, what if I just, what if I saw, we've had other church members before you, guess what? Some of them leave for no good reason. What if I just looked at all of you when I was preaching here on Sunday? What if I was up here just jaded like, well, you won't be here long. <laughs> at some juncture, you're cheating the people that are in your life right now because of the perception that is colored by the pain of your past. You're holding the people you're with hostage. You're trying to hold them accountable for your baggage. And now you put up all these walls and you might be tempted to even say like, well, I am never letting someone get that close to me again. Because that's what, I, that's what you get when you let someone in. And so it's just going to be me and Jesus. That's lonely. That is a recipe for a lonely, bitter life is what it is. I'm telling you right now. Or maybe it's just, it's just me and my spouse. But I can only trust them. And so I can't let anybody. What if Jesus was like that? Who would Jesus have been able to hang out with if it was someone that was going to be a faithful friend to him? Because it says when they arrested him, his disciples scattered like sheep without a shepherd. That not one of them stood with him when he was betrayed. Are you understand what I'm saying? At some juncture, you got to let it go. Let it, look at me. Look at me. If you're wondering, is this sermon for you? It is for you. Let it go. Go, let it go. I know that it hurt, but you've got to let it go. If you don't let it go, the hate consumes your heart. And now all of a sudden, you can't be the wife that God wants you to be. You can't be. You can't hold on to hate and pick up your cross at the same time. Christianity, if done correctly, is the exercise of gambling on sinners over and over and over and over again. And I will not cheat someone out of the opportunity to hear truth based upon my jaded past experiences. I have to divorce myself from the pain I have to let go of the rigidity of believing in the flawed nature of man. And I have to say, despite all of my past experiences, I choose, I choose love. I choose grace. Not all people are, not all women are nagging, dripping, faucet. Not all of them. There are some. You know who you are. But not not all of one race is something. Not all, you can't generalize to all. All is so bad. I was in seminary class. All right, seminary, East Texas. If you don't know East Texas people, well, they're a little different, okay? And I, I apologize, but I use the word pop, okay? Like in uh, Tulsa, I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's kind of a Midwest vibe in Oklahoma. And, and I said, I, I'm going to go get a pop. A guy looked at me. Look, serious as a heart attack. I'm talking cowboy boots, wranglers, the full Texas handlebar mustache looking guy. 
and just short of a cowboy hat because he was indoors. And he was like, are you a Yankee? I was like, am I a what? I'm from Oklahoma. We have no beef. We, we, we're not even on either side. We were just like, we were where we put all the Indians is what Oklahoma was. Like, we got no claim to fame. Like, ask yourself, what is Oklahoma famous for? The Oklahoma Sooners, the national champion. But anyway, that's, that's all we got in Oklahoma. And this guy, because I said pop, he put me in the Yankee category. Now, I'm not saying that if you're from the North that I don't want to be a Yankee, but I'm saying I wasn't thinking I was a Yankee or a rebel. I thought that that war ended like 200 years ago, but apparently this guy in full redneck mode thought that he could generalize who I was. I'm going to tell you, when it comes to that perception, that perception, I don't like it because when it comes to who has betrayed me the most, it hasn't been northern people. It's been southern Christians that put a smile on their face. That's the one. So if I was generalizing, I got no beef with Boston. Boston people have never done me wrong. That They never have. I'm just telling you right now, northern people are not bad. Is anybody from the north in here? All right. I expect you to tithe extra today because I said that. Why do we generalize and want to put all of these people into one class? All Democrats are X. All Republicans are X. All mask wearers, all vaccine people, all. Do you think that we do that to somewhat like put up walls? And if we're not careful, are those things meaningful to the kingdom of God? No. So stop it. Let it go. Let it go. Last one. Perception can become deception not only when we are ruled by our past pain, but when we base things on our preconceived ideas of what's possible. Whenever Jesus interacted with the disciples, this happened all the time. Remember, he said, hey, you see this crowd of people, 5,000 plus women and children, probably 10,000 crowd. I want you to go ahead and feed these people. What did their minds default to? Preconceived idea. Is it possible to feed 10,000 people with five loaves and a couple of fish? No, it's not possible. So therefore, my brain, as it did earlier when we started this morning's message, it defaults to what you believe is possible as what is possible. And this played itself out over and over again. As a matter of fact, one of the more serious times, there was this man whose child was possessed and this demon was causing this child to convulse and, and just tormented this child. And finally, this father brings this young man to Jesus, and he's desperate as any parent would be. And I thought, man, what if he, what if he would have allowed his past pain to indicate what was presently possible? He would have said, God, why did you cause this to happen to my son? Why did you allow that? And all of a sudden, now I'm going to blame God for the painfulness that I'm experiencing in a fallen world. But instead, this father pushed past his pain so that his son could have an opportunity to experience life change on a radical level. And he says to Jesus, if you could do something, I would appreciate it. And Jesus, in true, I mean bravado, I love this Jesus, all right? I mean, Jesus was like swagger Jesus. I'm talking like walk, I mean, he's like, if, if, did you say if, if, if I can do it? I mean, I think he almost loves the challenge. If I can do it, with, with God, I'm going to tell you something. All things are possible to those who believe. To which he responds with one of the greatest lines written in the Bible that every single one of us will have a moment with in our lifetime. He said, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. And then Jesus prayed over his son, cast out the demon, and the last thing that Jesus said in his prayer that it would never enter him again. And I thought, maybe someone walked in here and you have a past perception of who God is and what is possible, and you've surrendered in your mind to a false, fantasaical thought of, I am angry because that's how I've always been. I'm introverted and that's how I've all. I'm depressed and that's how I've always been. That is what's possible within your power. But that is not what is possible within 
his power. What if you brought your problem to his power? power this morning, and he cast out something you've been struggling with all your life, and he said, it shall never enter you again. Would you want to be set free today from your past pain? Yes. Yes. Quit telling God what is possible. You don't have to stay that way. You don't have to be that way. That is not something that is in stone. In the name of Jesus, life change is possible. Freedom is available. Today, it could be your day. And Jesus is sitting there looking at you going, if? It's not an if. I can do it. You got to trust me. All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask God that you move and you do what only you can do. I pray, Father, for those of us that have had painful past experiences. God, I pray that we would learn to let it go that we would let love win, that we would let people in, that we would know the sum total is that it's going to be messy, it's going to hurt, but for the ones we win, it's worth it. That my investment sometime is going to be squandered by someone who doesn't use it wisely, but when I put enough out there when I throw enough seeds out there, when I put enough dollars out there, when I put enough of my time out there, that harvest is going to come in. And that young couple's gonna walk in. That blended family is gonna walk in. And they're gonna hear a message that's going to give them hope that they did not previously have. It's going to give them a new picture to aim at. And if this morning we would all aim at God's best and God's will, it would set us free. Would you guys stand and worship with us?